Hello fellow homebrewers, JP here, and I want to introduce to you the brand new Brewbuilt X1 Conical Series available at More Beer. More Beer sells the highest standard in homebrewing equipment, and the Brewbuilt Conicals are just that. They're made from mere polished 304 stainless steel, and they come with loads of features that you and I have been looking for. They have a full 2-inch bottom dump valve, which will eliminate your clogging issues, while the sturdy base includes four reinforced legs, just like those big pro tanks do. More Beer also carries the Brewbuilt line of options and add ons like casters, pressure kits, and even external glycol chillers. So you can find out more about the new Brewbuilt X1 Conical Uni Tanks by going over to morebeer.com for detailed videos on the entire line of Brewbuilt Conicals. You can trust Brewbuilt with your next fermentation, and you can trust More Beer to find the right conical for you. Brewbuilt at morebeer.com. Beer is about drinkability. Doesn't oh, matter yeah. the style. You guys are like walking beer Wikipedia. That's the first time that you've ever accepted me as a person. Or you have a fermentation in your gut. Yeah. I'm jet propelled at all times. <laughs> How many guys do you think that you have the privilege to slap? Somebody who's never tasted a commercial example, and this is how you know everything about this beer? Please, you don't. I think you know, it's bullshit. The, <laughs> I think it's bullshit, too. Wow. Are you guys going to arm wrestle? No. no. We're going to teabag fight. Yeah. <laughs> you heard of Junkyard Wars? Can I get another high five, Beavis? <laughs> now, live from the Brewing Network Studios in Northern California, this is the radio program for home brewers. Craft brewers, beer lovers, and beer geeks. It's your only source for live beer radio that brings expert brewers together with, well, expert drinkers. This is the radio program with a head on it. This is The Session. Welcome, everybody. It's the session, the final session of 2020, which is, uh, I don't know about you guys, but it's personally been the best year in, of my entire life. This has been a great year. I can't wait until I see what uh, 2021 has in store for us because um, nothing can really top this. I'm, this. This year was uh, phenomenal for everyone. You haven't stopped talking about it. That's all, that's all I really talk I mean, about. It's every day, best yeah. year of my life. I go, please, please, there's a <laughs> pandemic going on. Can you settle down? Yeah. And I go, well, look, man, everyone, you, you can pick nits all you want, okay? But um, I don't know. It's been a banger year for, for most everybody, especially small business. I feel like <laughs> small business and the um, the the introverted very very much exactly so. right, yeah yeah. If you're, if you're holed up in your home, you enjoy doing that all the time. This was an amazing year for you. Yeah, I've run through about six sets of sheets, uh, which these usually last me about ten years. So. <laughs> Why? What Marshall, are you doing? We're, we're live now. I don't know if you know this. You probably. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm sorry. I was talking in personal press, private matter, private matter. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, w- welcome everybody. We are here, of course, with Marshall from Brewlosophy, um, and we're going to be talking some homebrew. I feel like the best way to sort of close out 2020 is uh, chatting a little bit about homebrew. We've, we've done a lot of commercial beer focused shows lately, and you know, every once in a while, we like to sort of direct and sort of uh, you know bring everybody around towards homebrewing topics every now and then within those you know commercial sessions. But this is going to be 100% homebrewing related. Now, I haven't homebrewed in uh, a long, long time. Although I have a setup, I just haven't used it yet because I need to figure out how to. It's the brew, the brewzilla got up from the more beer fellas. Oh, okay. And I have no yeah. idea how to use it. I like texted Chris Graham. I was like, "Hey, so uh, how do I do it?" He goes, "Hey, you just put in some water. You'll figure it out." And I'm like, "Oh." Well, it's grain, it's water, it's hops and yeast, yeah. right? Is that that's it? Right? Sure, but I don't know. I don't know the water to grain ratio, and then you have to sparge, oh, okay. and I don't know how much water. So I, I haven't done it yet. Uh, but I'm I'm going to email Chris tomorrow. I'm going to swear to him that in the first quarter of 2021, I will learn how to brew. And I will homebrew on this <laughs> stupid thing, and I will become a home brewer again. So I'm very excited for the show, Marshall. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited. Too, I, I'm sorry, Marshall. I just want to say real quickly before you jump in, I'm excited too. I mean, before, I started before, this whole thing before you jump in to answer the question. <laughs> oh, I was. It, was it a question? I was just. I was just like. Uh, you know, piling just, on with how great homebrewing is. and I'm just kidding. It. I'm sorry. Go ahead, right, Sally. You want, can we start over? <laughs> no. Sorry, Marshall. This Reset. is your time to shine. I'll be quiet. This is not. A, you know, I'm just I'd the rather pro brewer in the corner. Tonight. I don't even think it was a question. I was just, I'm just pulling chains. Go ahead, Sully. What were it's you saying? Fine. I was just going to say, this will take about five minutes, so sit back. 
Um, I was just going to say that, you know, I, you know, I started as a home brewer too, like a lot of pro brewers and I, and I miss it. It's been a little while since I've done it, but I've actually been thinking about doing it this past year. Then I haven't been thinking about it doing it in a while, but the most important thing is I have been thinking about it and I have all my equipment. I mean, we developed a lot of, you know, brews, uh, my home brew that turned into beers that were released. So, I mean, I'm excited to hear what you have to say. I saw the list of stuff and, um, I'm just going to sit back and take notes. Hell yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, the talk, so the Marshall, beer. talk away. There we go. Yeah. Applicable to the commercial scale. I'm sure that's <laughs> what everyone wants to hear out there. <laughs> that's all you can. It's it, homebrewing recipes are, are, are classic. They're well known for being scalable easily. Right. Right. Yeah, exactly. 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 Yeah. Everything you do on this scale. Yep. Right. Just it's interesting though, Jason, because the, the reality is that where we are today, if the last time you brewed a batch was six or seven years ago, Things really are different in the way that people view making beer at home. Um, the Bruzilla is a perfect example. Rather yeah. than lighting a fire under a kettle, you get to press a couple of buttons and wonder what else you're supposed to be doing. Yeah, you plug in, <laughs> you plug in your kettle, and especially since the Pico Brew sort of, you know, they went out yeah, of right, favor, right. which I was disappointed with uh, personally. I really liked using the you Pico system. I loved it. I thought it was really, really great, and I thought it was sort of the shot in the arm that the industry needed, especially that. That higher end, and you know, even even way back, we were talking uh, with the more beer well, talking when I was working at more beer, um, we were sort of looking at the Australian homebrew market as like sort of inspiration for how to bring that ease of use and that sort of accessibility to people. Uh, granted, Pico Brew was on the higher end of, of that scale, but it still sort of you know mattered to people who don't necessarily have time to do this or space to do this. Here's the thing that you can do. So I really do like these automated systems. Um, I just uh, you know, uh, they, there is a learning curve there. But, uh, you know, I thought, I don't know, 10 years ago, it's like there's no room for anybody to make a weird homebrew gadget anymore. Come to find <laughs> out, there's a plenty of room. You just got to, you know, think about it. <laughs> That's what most people are using nowadays. In fact, if you look at the curve of uh, the rise in electric homebrewing setups, I think the Pico Brew was at the very start of it. And yeah. I think it'd be hard to separate that rise from the fact that the Zymatic was out there and people were interested in something that was more plug and play oriented. Um, I, we do a we do an annual survey just to kind of gauge, you know, thumb on the pulse of the homebrewing scene. And it's shocking. I'll look up the numbers here in a sec. But but the the proportion of homebrewers who take that survey, which we cut it off around 26 or 2700 respondents, Ha, it, who are electric brewing has risen phenomenally just in the last four years. Wow. I believe is it track. Is it track against age? Cause like as an old guy, I, I would totally be over that, all over that. I'd be like, all right, I get to push a button and then take a nap. I'm all over that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, does it <laughs> you can't break it down that deep, Sully. Well, let's get on it. Then. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I guess you could, it's just an extra feel. You know what you need is someone who's used to looking through data. Oh yeah. 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 Go find one of those people. <laughs> <laughs> I've got it up here now. I'll, I'll tell you. The, yeah. Well, we we break it down by age, and uh, so this this one, just to so twenty twenty seven hundred sixty nine people. Um, Hell yeah. Forty two percent. Forty two percent of all of the uh, of the people who took this survey were thirty to thirty nine years old. Uh, only twelve percent were under thirty years old. That's wow. wild to me. Why? Because uh, I started when I was twenty one, twenty one, yeah. twenty two. Yeah. Right. And that yeah. was the, everybody I know who's my age now started way back in their twenties. It doesn't seem to be the case anymore or people aren't getting started and we just stuck around because <laughs> we still <laughs> like it, I guess. Yeah. I think that's <laughs> it. And I mean, I remember again, being at the, at the sort of edge of the homebrew scene in the, you know, late nineties, early two thousands. And there were not a lot of young people and especially mm -hmm. being a part of those, um, you know, whenever we got someone that was sub 40, everyone's like, Oh my God, this is great. This is cool. <laughs> Young blood. Yeah. Young blood, yeah. Yeah, we don't have to have uh, aspirin out for everybody to use freely. Um, and then and then going to homebrew con, you started you started seeing younger people and the younger people would bring in their spouses. So you were starting to get a different demographic gender wise mm -hmm. also, which was very nice too. And sort of the the whole thing sort of split open somewhere, I guess. I would guess around 2005, 2008 maybe where you started really noticing that there was a, a shift in the demographic of, of the homebrewers skewing younger and, uh, you know, spreading out. And now it seems like those younger people have stuck around. They've just aged a bit <laughs> into yeah. a, a different demographic. Cause they, yeah, they, it's just, I mean, obviously you're not going to see too many people admitting that they're under 21 in America homebrewing, I guess. <laughs> right. But, but still, uh, you know, that age range is, is just interesting to me. 
Um, but yeah, the, the electric home brewing thing, it's blown up, dude. I think you're going to love it. We've got uh, one of our guys, uh, one of the brewlosophy guys is brewing on a couple of Brewzillas that, that we also got for more beer and he loves it. Uh, you know, it takes a little bit of time cause it's 120, but still, you know, you dedicated circuit and you're good to go, man. man t- uh, time that I don't have to be doing anything is perfect. I mm-hmm. think it's great. No, I'm sorry, honey. I can't, I can't watch the kid. I'm, I'm brewing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But you're just waiting. Yeah. You know, you never know when this thing can go sideways. I got to stay on top of this. <laughs> yeah, I really got yeah, to do right. it. <laughs> so I tell new people in the hobbies that brewing is about 75% waiting, 10% cleaning, yeah. and then the rest is actually doing shit, you know, that, that is exactly. brewing related. It's yeah. like flying over the country. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, I appreciate you joining us, Marshall. And what I wanted to do really is is sort of get the rundown of of what has been popular in home brewing. Um, and, you know, for, for people who don't know, over at Brewlosophy, you guys sort of, um, I, well, and we've talked about it before. You've been on the show before. We don't like to say busting myths of home brewing. No. But I feel no. like you... You say you, myth busters of home brewing. You can say that. <laughs> that is definitely... No, but I, I feel like you sort of, like, correct the the thinking about what matters maybe i, I mean yeah <laughs> I, I, I would say that we just test interesting things out to see you know what impact they have uh when, i would believe it was national geographic or popular mechanics did an article on what we do a few years ago and they they the title of it was Mythbusters of homebrewing it started we got a lot of crap for that. Yeah. <laughs> well, because I did not come up with that. Well, no, but. because every time you're interviewed, the, everybody thinks that all of the information is just directly comes from you. That the that the reporter has no sort of you know say in it. Yeah. Or whatever. Exactly. <laughs> That's not what we're doing though. Um, re- really, you know, I, I think this is the case probably for most uh, most hobbies and and activities that people engage in because they enjoy. Is you get to a point where you're kind of stuck and maybe even a little bit bored. So you start looking for other things, other ways to keep it interesting. Mm -hmm. And I was in a spot where, you know, I've got a PhD in psychology, so I'm kind of interested in human perception. Uh, And so I was to a point where I thought, well, I'm going to start kind of putting uh, some of this stuff that I learned in grad school into this, this hobby of mine and see where it goes. And, and that's what, that's where we've ended up. Uh, The, the initial intent was actually for me to learn why it is we do certain things and it just so happens that that the results from these very, very, you know, when we, you isolate a variable so much, uh, sometimes it might be that that it's a it's a compounded effect. But uh, the results have been uh, uh, different than what I expected for for the most part. That's right. You're challenging the the, the social norms of homebrew. I mean, and that's really <laughs> all. Uh, that, that's sort of I think what home brewing or any hobby sort of needs really to to progress is uh, you, you need somebody to look at it analytically and go, well, why are we doing this? You know, if, I mean, imagine if we all just stayed with, um, I'm going to be, I'm a, such an asshole homebrew right now, but um, Charlie Papazian's book. Well, what's it called? What's wrong with that? No, I'm just kidding. What was it called? <laughs> the, the Complete Joy. Thank you. Yeah, the, the Complete Joy of Homebrew. Yeah. Imagine we would all just be boiling chickens in our wort. Like, oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. There's no sort of, <laughs> or we'd, we'd be doing like <laughs> secondary fermentations or whatever, but... You know, you just sort of need that on a mass scale, too, because then you can have it anecdotally on some forum where some guy like Big Wart Masher 69420 says, I don't do <laughs> secondary ferment. And then, you know, no one knows about it. Well, no, I, I, I love this because honestly, it's like, I mean, when talk about scalability, I mean, you do things in a professional brewery that you just do because well, we've always done it that way. Yeah. And, and you, and you don't know why sometimes while you're doing it, it's just sort of this institutional knowledge that kind of exists in sort of, you know, any brewery you go to, you see it a lot of old breweries, especially, you know, when we've contract or excuse me, partner brewed at other breweries, you know, <laughs> you're, you, you go, why are we doing it that way? It's like, well, we've always done it that way. Well, why? Well, I don't know. Cause the last guy did it that way. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, so this is, this is good stuff. Well, and, and I think for what made it so uh, successful for us was that uh, it requires an element of risk, you know, risk taking. There's a potential that you're going to screw up a batch, which you just can't do that on a commercial scale. Yeah. You know, if, even just taking the risk, maybe it won't make a difference, but that risk alone uh, and the potential for having to dump, you know, 15 barrels of beer down the drain. I don't care if I have to dump five gallons of beer yeah. down the drain. If I learn something from it, it's worth it. I mean, I grew up, my, my favorite channel to watch was Discovery Channel as a kid. I wasn't much into cartoons and, and Star Wars, you know? Um, and so this is just kind of me putting that mentality, I guess, to use uh, in, a, in, a, in a realm that I find really interesting. 
Uh, yeah. And, you know, and, and what's interesting to me is that, is that if you go and you look at, we're, we're going to talk about some of the more popular experiments that we've performed just based on, on views, uh, uh at brewlosophy.com. If you look at the ones that are the most popular, they're all, they were all written almost five years ago. I mean, these articles were published almost five years ago, wow. but there's something about these specific variables that I think people just find, uh, either valuable or interesting or want to know if it actually matters type of thing. So you mentioned throwing chickens in, in the, uh, in the wort. <laughs> I think yeah. one of the reasons they used to do that was because of the collagen in chicken bones, uh, would help to clarify the beer in the end. And nowadays we use that collagen. It's just in an isolated form called gelatin. That's right. We put it in our uh, lips and our, in our cheek. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Eyebrows, you know? Yeah. yeah. Well, let's actually, uh, that's a good segue. Let's get into the first one It's the gelatin effect. Yeah, this was a. Uh, What's this about? I I'd never heard of um I'd never heard of clarifying beer with gelatin up until about five or six years ago. A friend of mine who was relatively new in home brewing, uh, which means he was on way different forums than I was accustomed to at the time. <laughs> he uh, he said that he'd been doing it and his beers were just coming out brilliantly clear. Now, as an aside, this was way before the hazy IPA thing uh, when he started doing this, probably yeah. five or six, seven years ago, something like the that. The good old days, right? The good old days, yeah. <laughs> Um, and so he had, he was brewing these beers that were far more clear than, than most of me and my homebrew, my homebrew buds were, were making. And so I figured I'd, I'd test it out. Uh, I, as I was researching it, obviously I think the biggest claims, uh, or that, well, if you, if it's pulling out the haze causing stuff, it's also going to pull out stuff that tastes and smells good, Sure. Uh, which sounded reasonable to me. I mean, you, you know, um, but but as I dug deeper and deeper, what what I came to discover in my research was that gelatin, um, when it's mixed with water, becomes slightly positively charged. And so when it hits wort, that positive charge is going to naturally attract negatively charged things, which in the case of beer is yeast uh, and more notably protein, which are two of the biggest haze causers in beer. Mm -hmm. um, you know, polyphenols and stuff of the flavor compounds. None of, there's no, there's not much research on it pulling that stuff out. Um, one could argue that if it pulled everything out, you'd have a beer that wasn't beer. It was just water with a slug of beer on the bottom. Uh, and so I ended up putting it to the test in a, a dry hopped pale ale. I wanted something really hoppy just to see uh, what would happen. And lo and behold, tasters were unable to tell uh, the beers apart. You know, you, you had, uh, I served, uh, let's see. How many people did I? This was in the early days, so it may not have been too many, but uh, 12 people. Uh, out of those 12, we would have expected eight people to, uh, to get it right if it was significant. Uh, only five people did, so just, just over a third of the people, which you'd expect in random guessing. Yeah. Um, these beers, and, and, and just on an anecdotal level, they tasted identical to me. I mean, I couldn't tell them apart if they, weren't, if they were in opaque glasses. And because I've I've heard this about the filtering, and I've I've found it to be true, you know, in my own home brewing, but with like the plate filters, with the yeah. actual filter pad, that's definitely, and you you can tell it's pulling out because the filter pad changes color. I mean, there's there's something in there, and it does taste a little, you know, different. It tastes a little lighter, maybe, but uh, but with gelatin, I don't think I've ever used gelatin. I was always too cool for that. <laughs> too cool for gel <laughs> gelatin's the poor man's clarifier, dude. Come well, on now, you know. That's what we use in the hood. Uh, the, we've done a, we've done an experiment on mechanical filtration as well, and if I recall correctly, people couldn't tell those beers apart either. I, you know, the huh. thing is, we we talk a lot about bias and sensory analysis, and yeah. if I see two beers and they look different, chances are I'm going to perceive them on my palate differently as well. It's a part of the reason these days you have to have a hazy beer on tap if you want to stay in business as a, a commercial brewer. People expect to see it. It could taste exactly like you know, uh, uh, your classic West Coast clear IPA. But if it's not hazy, people are going to taste it differently. Yeah, I, I do think hey, the hazy thing has sort of transcended reality and now just become <laughs> um, an object of people's desires rather than a focal point for flavor. And it does change the flavor. It's I'm a not, look. I'm not, yeah, it's a look. I'm not going to say that it's not. It doesn't taste right. Right, But right. It's, it's, it's become the thing to chase instead of, you know, people figuring out what it's there for. Mm -hmm. Which yeah, is very funny. it's an interesting phenomenon. I mean, I it, it, now it's the it's it's become a thing of beauty. Whereas what seven or eight years ago, I wouldn't I wouldn't have touched a friend's beer if it looked like that no. because I I love my wife and wouldn't want to hurt her in bed that night. <laughs> yeah. That's oh, what I would have been thinking the entire time. Is is there's no way I'm going to let that into my gut. And nowadays it's just the norm. And I you know on some mm -hmm. level I got to give credit to the people who made it who made it big because. 
people love it. I mean, consumers love it. And if, and if that's your gauge, then good Lord, they're doing a good job, you know? So uh, the ones that yeah. have flakes in it, I don't get that. I don't, that's what I don't get. Yeah. It's a little too weird. I, I wonder where the, uh, especially with the pandemic, I wonder where the commercial beer industry would be if we didn't have this hazy beer thing. Cause there yeah. are breweries, Sully, we've talked about this before. There are breweries who are sort of keeping it together because of, of hazy beers. Not necessarily oh, yeah, right now. But I mean, like, yeah, those, you know, those are the newer breweries that have, you know, just sort of popped on the scene in the last five years or so. Yeah. Um, but I mean, look, beer sales are way up. I mean, well, actually, that's I was just going to use Sierra Nevada as the example. I mean, but their big seller right now is Hazy Little Things. So mm-hmm. um, it's definitely on a mass scale. It's super popular as well. But, um, you know, you, you made and Marsh, you made a point about like um, what your preconceived notion is before you try something. I had that happen to me today. I was told that. To, t- to taste something that I knew was so- there was something wrong with it. And yeah. I'm just like totally finding it, you know, I'm like, all right, yeah, it's there. And, you know, um, this is something I had tasted before. So I already knew what I was going to taste. Um, but yeah, that, uh, the idea that you walk into a situation like that, you really need to be blind on it. So. Yeah. It's, I, we, we pulled a little prank on one of my neighbors a while back where um, I, a buddy of mine is constantly saying he tastes metallic and stuff. And so, uh, so <laughs> we, can we beer. yeah, well, it, yeah, that's the old, that's Speaking the old thing. Right? Yeah. <laughs> You're doing it right. Sully. Um, the, what we did is we, we, all of us are, our go to refreshing beer is Miller light around these parts. And so what we had done is poured, like prepped a pint of Miller light for my buddy who constantly tastes metallic, but we told him, it was a beer that he had previously thought had said had a metallic. So sure enough, he's drinking it out of the pint glass and all he tastes is metallic until he found out that, it, you know, it's your, it's your favorite water beer in there. And it, but it, ha- but it's, it's so predictable and it's so easy to set up. Everybody falls for it. It doesn't mean you're stupid. That's just human nature. I mean, yep. we all mm-hmm. do it. If you tell somebody to expect a difference, they will find it and they'll invent what that difference is. And then they will stick to their guns. It's a fascinating phenomenon. See, never be friends with a psychologist. Yeah, I'm telling you, man. I'm <laughs> never analyzing you. Don't ever do it. Hey, why That's come your, your living room has all couches? I don't understand. Well, why don't you lay down and we'll talk <laughs> we'll just, about it. Let's have a conversation about that. So why do you why are you talking about the couches so much? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Barbecues at Marshall's house are never that fun. <laughs> People are in the corner crying. Yeah. My yeah. dad, <laughs> damn it. <laughs> Give me another rib. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, the gelatin thing's an interesting one. We've done quite yeah. a few experiments on that variable um, in various states. In fact, I was talking with John Palmer a while back, and he wondered about the impact. you Because you don't use that much gelatin in a five-gallon batch, or even in a – I've had friends uh, uh, find 15-barrel batches, and you're just not using that much. So he wondered if it would – you know, the clarifying would happen faster if you used way more. And it, it, as it stands, it, the, it actually uh, did not clear the beer anywhere near as well, which I thought was interesting. Hmm. Um, yeah, we've, looking- done, we've done gelatin experiments as well on New England IPA. In fact, it was, uh, we did that as a collaboration with a buddy of mine on the East Coast. And uh, yeah, it didn't clear the New England IPA. It made it slightly less opaque uh, than the non-gelatin fine one, but it makes you wonder what's in there, what's hanging around if it's not <laughs> yeast and protein. It's so yeah. weird. It's yeah. so weird. We did the same thing. We actually did a 12 barrel batch of a, of a hoppy Pilsner and we use this product called biofine, which is mm-hmm. basically a colloidal solution of silicate acid. And, uh, it didn't clear up. So I said, well, let's add more and nothing ever happened. It never cleared. It was, yeah. it was always had this light haze to it. Mm. I think there's we pulled a, everything out that we could. There's a saturation point where it just doesn't. Yeah. And the, the part of it that, that gets me is that it's, it, there's, you know, if you, if you take the whole picture of what it, you know, what it takes to make a New England IPA versus a West Coast IPA, it's really not that disparate. I mean, the, the, you know, you're not doing that many things different. And yet what those small things do is produce this, you know, I heard the term haze stability, <laughs> <laughs> but it makes sense. You know, well, you it, does. Have, it totally does. Yeah, yeah sure. But yeah. also fuck that person. <laughs> well, you're right about that. I mean, it is important. I mean, it's funny to say, but I mean, otherwise, if you don't have that, you're going to end up with like, you know, a big chunk of yeah, yeast that's right. or some other protein at the bottom of your can or bottle. Well, and that's Which what, some people don't care about these days. I mean, that's, yeah. Yeah, that's really the beauty of the can. You can kind of like, you know, yeah, yeah. mix it up a little bit. Yeah. Well, that's what Warren and I used to always rail on at the, at the early days of this thing where we couldn't shut up about hazy IPAs because <laughs> it's the chunky parts. And that's what all hazy beers were at that point that that we had come across but i think somewhere along the line 
you know, information sort of filtered out, no pun intended, to make these beers <laughs> without chunks in them, but have that hazy thing. And so now that's that. I think you see less chunks. Or at least I read about it less on Instagram because I, I don't I, know. I think you see more intentional chunks is, is what I'm noticing. Is really? beers being made? Yes, dude. Uh, the the um, what are they calling them? The, the fruit loops? Fruit. Yeah. Stuff like yeah. <laughs> there's like the I, I mean, I have seen people love you know comment on these beers that they're pouring that have little chunks of fruit in them they have but that's that's what people are after it just i don't get it and i'm willing to accept others do i have to ask you though jason is there a hazy beer that you've had so far that you would say you know what i'll go back and have have another pint of that no okay i'm in the same boat but i'm in the same boat but there have been beers that I, i can't remember and they've all been on the show like the majority of the exposure that i've had to hazy ipas has been from doing this show Right, because it's forced upon me, but um, it's my job at that point, which is kind of cool. But uh, I've I've never taken one from the wild, so to speak. But I've had beers that I've gone, okay, I can see why people like this style. Right, I I can sort of get it, and those are few and far between. A lot of those hazy beers are they they're aspirin-y, and yep. they're just they're kind of gritty, and they I don't get it. Like I don't I don't understand it because there's no flavor except this weird. Oh, there's hop flavor. Yeah, and... but sort of, but like not, and it's sort of it this is thing. Sweet. But the mm. ones that I do get are they have a softer malt, like the malt mm. kind of comes through also, and it's not just a thing. And uh, but yeah, there's 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 those are few, those are few to that make me realize, oh, okay, I understand this could be a good commodity for people to purchase. Yeah, yeah it's it, my my mean. experience with uh, hazy IPA that I that I've actually somewhat enjoyed have come all come from being up in Yakima for hop harvest. Mm. And having fresh hop versions of it, and I, I think a part of it is is that that earthy, grassy, in a good way thing that you get from fresh hop beers, happens to pair well with that odd aspirin-y, chalky thing that I get in most hazy IPAs. Not that I would chug it like I would, you know, a, a chucking up pilsner or something, but it, you know, <laughs> it's good. I mean, yeah. it's it's good enough, and not as bad as I would expect. Uh, what so about West Coast style hazy IPAs? Have you had those? It's sort of variant, like where it's actually more bitter and. Uh, but still has like that turbidity and also hmm. the hop flavor and aroma. Have you had those yet? I've come across one or two of those, whether or not they know that they were doing that or not. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's what my comment was going to be exactly <laughs> yeah. what you said. <laughs> I don't know if it was intentional on their part, but I've had bitter Nor- New England IPAs. I, yeah. I made one that was not intentional, <laughs> and I was like, God damn, this is good, so I'm going to make it again. There you go. <laughs> Happy accidents. Uh, there you go. Uh, there's someone in the chat asking a question about the uh, the gelatin experiment. Uh, he's saying, yeah. w- was the timing between the two the same set of time from Brew Day? Did you test after the unclarified beer settled? Yeah, uh, that, that's a good question. So the timing on all of our experiments, we, um, regardless of what the variable is, we obviously there are going to be some variables where you have to brew differently. Biotransformation dry hop is one where we settled on brewing two days apart uh, so that we could test that out in the cleanest way possible. For this one, the beers were brewed right, you know, they were brewed next to each other, fermented next to each other, packaged at the same time. Uh, after a day of cold crashing in primary, one got gelatin, the other didn't. Then they were both packaged, what, two or three days later. And they set in the keg for probably a week or two before we started collecting data. Um, I did only collect one set of data uh, and didn't didn't hold out for too long. I the argument that we should be waiting like three or four months before collecting data. I don't know anybody who likes beer that old, hmm. um, but but we see that quite often. Well, if you'd waited just a couple more weeks, but I don't want to wait that long. Right? The whole point in home brewing is to have beer as quickly as possible that tastes all right. You know. Yeah. Well, um, I, f- I feel like if you waited that long, you would be skewing the the results because who waits that long? The age effect for their yeah, home yeah. brew. Nobody. I, I've, I'm drinking more pints uncarbonated, or at least undercarbonated, uh, of my own beer than I have fully carbonated beers because I'm impatient. Well, and, and uh, Sully could talk about this more than I can, uh, but, but most of the commercial brewers that I know of aren't sitting on beer for three weeks before they keg it up and put it in the in the you know the brewery it's it, you, no it's you in wanna, and out typically it's in and out you put it yeah. in the right tank and you want to get rid of it as soon as possible right right and so the idea is uh, using practical methodology and un- understanding you know of, of what other brewers are doing uh that's the approach we typically try to take so this one i mean you look at the fact that the the gelatin beer was as clear as it was i mean it was almost it was it was almost bright yeah it was, looked like it was filtered yeah i was looking at the 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 pictures that you put up there and you you put up uh, uh ones like from the you know day after in the keg and then a little bit yeah. longer a little bit longer and that unfiltered just sort of gets cloudier 
And what's interesting about this as well, just again, kind of as a, as a, a kind of post hoc analysis here is that those were fermented with uh, the Fuller strain, which is a highly flocculent strain. It's known to, yep. to you know, drop as hard as a rock. And yet it's still that beer was still hazy, which, uh, which to me suggests since it was pretty heavily dry hopped, that that was likely a function of the dry hop. And so again, this argument that if you're going to, if you're going to find a beer that's been dry hopped, you're going to pull out, you're going to lose a lot of the, of the value that you put into that beer, right? Cause it's going to pull out those hop, the hop goodness. It just didn't seem to do that. Uh, and, and anecdotally, I've probably gelatin find 200 batches of beer since then. I've never had an issue. Uh, we've got one of the guys over here who refers to it as powdered time. I kind of <laughs> like that. <laughs> yeah. T H Y M E, I imagine. <laughs> yeah, right. Right. <laughs> well, let's talk a little bit about uh, your uh, another experiment you did: uh, high versus low mash temperatures. Oh yeah, I thought I mean, this was know. really interesting, man. Because like, yeah, we've 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 even said it on the show or in the early days, or I, I still hear it every now and then. Well, I mashed at one forty seven. Well, try one fifty two and see if that really helps. <laughs> Actually, some of the guys on Doctor Homebrew even do that, and I stop myself from stepping in, going. Three, four degrees is not going to matter. Eh, I promise you it's not going to matter. <laughs> well, at where, I We've think seen it, a difference, like a one degree difference. Which is, I mean, this, you have? Mm-hmm. Pray well, tell. Marshall has something to tell you. I know. Well, I'm, I'm, cool. This is, you're punking me right now, Marshall. Right. I know what's yeah, going yeah. on right now. Yeah, we're, uh, we're setting you up. Uh, oh, Sully, um, you've seen a one degree difference. I'm making yes, Come in uh, and uh, have a seat here. Sit down. <laughs> Lay on the couch. Yeah. Let's talk about this. Yeah. You just over oxygenated, uh, sir. <laughs> what are your feelings about that, Sully? That's, uh, the, the, the thing about Who's mash temperature this? is there's an inarguable effect that it has on uh, on beer uh, there's there's absolutely measurable predictable impact that that beta amylase and alpha amylase are going to have in the mash we know that it's well established we've shown it over and over and over again the argument that that inspired me to test it out was that if the, if you're mashing too warm you're gonna, there's going to be residual long chain dextrins that are perceptibly sweet uh, and that a higher FG, and I guess that's kind of a side argument, that a higher FG is going to result in a sweeter beer. I believed it. I bought it hook, line, and sinker, and then I went and tested it out um, like like the nut that I am. Um, it, it, oddly enough, <laughs> despite there being a rather a big difference in the uh, at finishing gravities of these beers, one finished at 10.05 and the other finished at 10.14, so a, a, a nine-specific gravity point difference. That to me is you're going to taste a difference. Um, that just wasn't the case. I, out of 20 people, 11 people should have uh, uh, gotten it right, been able to do that. That's not that many. It's barely over half. Uh, but if 11 people had gotten it right, we could have said with some confidence that these beers were distinguishable. Only nine people did. That's not much more than a third. Uh, and we've done this one over and over again as well. And people just cannot taste the difference, at least within the ranges that we've tested. This one in particular uh, was 147 degrees Fahrenheit versus 161. Because to me, those kind of are the extreme ends. Yeah, yeah for sure. Uh, the the Fahrenheit is. version, the book ends of, of your, your uh, you know, suggested mash temperatures. Yeah, uh, just wild to me. I couldn't tell them apart. They tasted identical to me. The biggest difference was their alcohol level, but I couldn't even taste the alcohol difference uh, between them. So what does that mean? It just mash temperature doesn't matter anymore? <laughs> Nothing <laughs> well, matters, I, I think Marshall? What about I think what, I, if, what what I've taken it to mean is that mash temperature is a is a ideal lever for adjusting uh, ABV. So if you want to make a session mm -hmm. IPA, stop trying to throw all these weird grains at it and making this this muddled mess. Just mash at one sixty five and see what you can get away with uh, with the grist that you might use for a standard pale ale. Hmm. I've done that, that, by the way. I just yeah. <laughs> what do you think, Sully? Well, I, I mean, I. I, I was just taking issue with it because that actually <laughs> that that came up today, uh, as a matter of fact. But we're actually dialing ABV in because we have to hit a hit a mark, or otherwise we'll be off and yeah. could get in trouble in you know, Texas. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, we were we are playing with minor adjustments in mash temperature, but there's other some there's other variables that are might be affecting um, this ABV issue, uh, and so we're just isolating each step as we go, so we know what we can measure in the end. Mm -hmm. So. Hmm. or what we are measuring in the end. I mean, that, that is shocking that to me change? because like, you know, part of the, 
the you know in the home brewing advice, it's always uh, you know what hops you're using. Make sure you're using fresh ingredients. Blah blah. blah and then it's mash temperature. Yeah. That's it, but you're telling me that it might not. So, Sully, you 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 sort of uh, muttered under your breath at one point. What about bitterness? Yeah, I did mutter. I do a yeah. lot of muttering, but yeah, no, yeah. I mean, I guess that's the other issue is that once you have a higher final gravity, that your perceived bitterness will drop off versus of drier beers. Essentially, if you have a drier beer, your bitterness, you know, all things being equal, be, will be uh, highly perceived uh, versus a higher uh, FG. See, and that's the, that was one of the things that I had to, I started questioning after these, the multiple mash temp experiments that we've done is what, what is it that we, we attribute final gravity as being uh, the, the sole, you know, contributor to, to dr- perceived dryness. And I, I'm not sure that's what it is. I, I wonder if it's not, for example, bitterness that contributes to that perception of dryness. If you give me a international amber lager that, that just doesn't have an, or a cow comet or something like that, that's known to be somewhat malty, but that doesn't have the, 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 the right level of bitterness, I might perceive it as being far more sweet than it actually is. Um, you know, and, and that's just because of the way sweetness and bitterness, you know, work uh, for human perception. So I, so I don't know if it's, um, I just don't know if it's FG that contributes to that perception of dryness. Obviously, there's objective dryness, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, if it finish, something finishes at 10.02, obviously you can call that dry. But, but you can make, I've had Saison fermented with specific strains that get all the way down to you know, 1.000 specific gravity that, that have body, that don't have that perception of crisp dryness. And so you're saying bitterness plays into that? I think so. I think, I, I think right. when, you ba- when it's balanced properly, you can toy around with per- the perception of dryness not arguing that it's a, a function of FG uh, based on the, the level of bitterness that you throw at a beer, I mm. think. Well, what's fascinating is, is the, the photos of the, fermenta- uh, the fermentation. So your low mash temp had like a big blow off, it looks like, but your high mash temp didn't. What is that? Yeah, just so- more proteins, short chain? I don't know. I don't know. I can't. I don't know. I don't even know the lingo anymore, dude. <laughs> Well, I think it's just because there was more fermentable sugar. I mean, those exactly. long-chain dextrins in the high mash temp aren't mm-hmm. fermentable, uh, mm-hmm. which is why you, had a, you resulted with a lower ABV and a higher FG. So you've just got more uh, uh, free you know, sugar in there for that yeast to ferment, so it just went a little more wild than the other one did. Hmm. That's, that's, my, that's just a hunch. Yeah, for sure. I think that's probably pretty correct. And you've done these several times. Yeah, we've done the mash temp one on various styles. Uh, you know, that's another one of the, the would, common right. responses we'll get is, well, maybe it's just for that style or, or whatever. So we've, yeah. done on, we've, we've done them with high ABV styles. Um, you know, and, and for the most part, I, I can't recall one, and somebody will call me out on this, I'm sure, but I can't recall one that came back significant uh, when looking specifically at uh, uh, just the, the impact of mash temperature. Um, I have to imagine that if you were to go to the ultra extremes and, you know, maybe do something like 135, you know, versus 180 or something, then I'm sure mm-hmm. you'd see a difference. But at, then you're out, you can start to get outside of those conversion zones. You know, the low mash temperature one being so active could be because it's next to that little red wagon and the other one is not. So that right. variable is not. <laughs> yeah, that's that extraneous that variables. Be damned. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you you can't prove that it wasn't. Now you have to do that one. Mm-hmm. Also, you is, have to get another red wagon. That's right. Yeah. Is uh, what thickness of the glass when you're a car boy? One is thinner <laughs> than the other. That could help too. So we don't actually really know, Marshall. Uh, I'm telling you, this is why we do it on the homebrew scale. That's right. <laughs> Can you imagine doing this kind of nonsense, Sully? Let's just ferment a big ass batch of at 1065. And uh, I mean, I mean honestly, that's the the joy of doing it at, at, at a brew pub. It's a smaller system. I mean, I wouldn't do it on a 500 barrel batch of beer, but you know, I, I could do it with 10 to 12 barrels because you know, the, you know, the rule of thumb in in uh, on that scale is that if it goes wrong, you dry hop it and change the name. <laughs> throw some throw some the, bugs that's at the it. The ancient yeah. brewing secret. Yeah. <laughs> it really is too, man. But, you know, back in the day, you could you could tell when that was the case, you know, when like, here's an amber saison 
No, this was this had a, this had some kind of contamination, and now it's just something else. And that's no, we're pushing boundaries. It's like years ago, I was at the barley wine festival at the Toronado, and somebody had brought like, and this is when people weren't doing Belgian beers, brewers weren't doing it, and somebody had a Belgian uh, barley wine. I was like, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I, I have to believe that Belgian IPA stemmed from an accident as well. Oh, for it, sure. Who in their right mind drinks that crap? Oh my god. <laughs> Don't get me started on that style. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'd rather have I'd rather have a New England IPA than that. I'll put it that way. Oh man, I'd rather water. Uh, let's I judge. I judge the first real quick. I judge the first year that was a, a a category at GABF, and it basically came down to this: American hops, Belgian yeast, every single beer, and it mm-hmm. was just like, ugh, it's gross. That's kind of what's yeah. happened to English IPA. I feel like, oh, if you ferment it with. The Fuller strain, you can call it English IPA. Well, it tastes just like a you know, Union Jack. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to take a quick break, everybody. It's the session. Hang on. We'll be right back. Segmented. Demented. Fermented. Fermented. It's the session. Yeah! Hey, thanks for hanging around, everybody. It's the session. We are here with Marshall from Brewlosophy. Brewlosophy.com. It's B R U. Um, because for some reason, uh, like myself, we can't help but just come up with weird names for our podcasts. Yeah, you know what I mean. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's kinda, that was a plus. You, you know, if you yeah. if you go brw, you're gonna. I got smart and I bought that domain. It didn't cost much. <laughs> yeah, I so I, my you know, mind's ears up with a, a Z, but I also got it with an S, and then I got yeah. it hyphenated and unhyphenated. Like you can't, right. you can't you plug it in at some combination of ears up and podcast, and you will you'll find me. If you get it wrong, you don't need to be listening. That's or, or watch or reading. That's basically it. Yeah. Or if you guess it right the first time, then there's another issue going on. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Speaking of issues, let's talk a little bit. You were mentioning before, um, you know, a couple times about dry hopping, and uh, you also have a, a an experiment: uh, long versus short dry hop length. And that's something that's also. This is why I like talking to you, man. Because number one, it sort of recharges me to homebrew, but also. <laughs> Um, it, these are things that we've talked about, and they are sort of debated, I guess, in you know, outside of homebrew clubs, probably not that often. But uh, you know, h- how what does it matter? What what does it matter doing long or short? Does it really make a difference? I, you know, I don't know. Fundamentally, you do whatever you want, do do whatever makes you feel <laughs> good um, to enjoy the hobby. But but if you're after, I think, repeatable results, um, you you should at least know where your flavors are coming from. So let's talk a little bit about this guy. Yeah, I, I think also uh, when it comes to dry hopping, if you're if you're after the most pungent hop character, it's worth thinking about. Um, I, I think on, from a layman's perspective, it makes sense that, oh, the longer those dry hops are in the beer, the more you're going to extract from them. Uh, so that's so that's a good thing. I, and, and up until I'm again, you know, five or six years ago. That was kind of, the, I mean, I, I don't think I dry hopped a beer until the early, two, you know, what, 2006, maybe 2007, <laughs> because to me, uh, IPA was just a bitter bomb. I mean, I remember the first IPA I ever made was like 136 IBU. Jesus. Uh, <laughs> yeah. What's wrong with you? We all had to try it. You know? No. <laughs> you never tried that, Jason? No, Come on. of course not. Oh, that was good. Are you kidding me? Yeah, yeah. That put hair on your chest. Yeah, well, um, that explains a lot about you. <laughs> there's very little there, actually, surprisingly. Yeah. There you go. Insider trading. Um but yeah, the the whole short, long dry hop thing, I was just curious about that one myself. Uh, I'd heard some talk, you know, uh, back in uh, early 2015 about people who were getting away with two-day dry hops or 36-hour dry hops. In fact, I think Matt from Firestone Walker had mentioned it yeah. uh, somewhere along the way. And so I was curious to test it out. And so we did, a, we did an experiment where uh, one batch was dry hopped for 11 days and the other one got the dry hop uh, for just two days. And in order, or, or in order to keep those uh, as similar as possible, they sat next to each other the entire time at the same temp. And so at day nine, I added the, the dry hops to the two day batch, basically. Um, and then they were they were cold crashed and packaged together. Um, and so in that one, what we ended up finding was out of 19 participants, 10 would have had to accurately identify the unique sample in order us in order for us to say that it was uh, statistically significant. And 12 actually did, uh, which just allows us to say that tasters were able to reliably distinguish these these beers, uh, which given the the controls that we put in place and how anal we are about brewing these things as similarly as possible, uh, allows us to stay with an element of confidence that the dry hop length is what uh, it made these beers taste uh, taste different. So. Mm-hmm. What temperature were they 
dry hopped at? So I, these ones were dry hopped at my standard ale fermentation temperature of about 66 Fahrenheit or 19 C. Okay. Because I've always heard, well, I say always, and, and I transpose a lot of things in, in my mind. But I thought that Brendelson saying like the, the, the three days or whatever was at lower temperatures and then he's... Uh, then he's like step, two like weeks or whatever up. was like yeah higher temperature. So I thought hmm. the temperature played into uh, into what te- into how long the dry hops you know go. I know Scott Janish has talked a lot about that as well and wrote yeah. about it in his in his book. Um, we we there's an experiment for that though. We've we've experimented with uh, dry hop temperature as well. Seventy six versus thirty six degrees Fahrenheit. Um, I'm scrolling down to look at those results. Uh, and that one was also significant. So it would make sense to me then that if length matters and temperature matters, that if you combine the two, that it is going to have mm-hmm. uh, kind of a cathected effect, this this blended combined effect. Yeah. I wonder if, I mean, it, so you do a lot of experiments with everything sort of being equal and you're changing one slight variable. I wonder if that would be a valid experiment to do the appropriate dry hopping uh you know technique for lower temperature versus higher temperature and seeing if those made a difference but yeah you know, timing and uh, that's that's a lot of work i'm already uninterested in it <laughs> yeah, i think there's some thinking that the lower dry hop temperature like sort of produces more of like a whole hop uh yeah. cone kind of aroma and flavor uh so i think that's what people are uh, after with that yeah uh, um we actually did a test on this ourselves on our big system and we found the sweet spot for us was three days. You know, I was, yeah. all, I was before that, I was of the common thinking that, you know what, it's got to be on there for a week, you know, and then we were like, okay, what are we getting here? We realized that we're getting kind of, you know, danker, more onion, garlicky kind of aromas that we, that we're sort of taking away from uh, the beer itself and not, re- and really just transforming it from the, the type of hops that we were using and those aroma uh, qualities. So, uh, and it's also with the other added benefit, I mean, this isn't, apply to home brewers so much, but I, it, maybe it does. Uh, if you like to make a lot of beers that you can turn your tank quicker. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I, I, um, I read somewhere and I, I want to say it was Janish, but, um, it could have been somewhere else that the cooler dry hopping, uh, extracts and keeps myrcene around longer, which is that green, fresh rubbed between your palms hop character that, mm-hmm. that I love. I mean, I, I think mm-hmm. that's one of the more fantastic things about fresh hop beers um, whereas the warmer one, it, it, the warmer temperature will extract more things like linalool and uh, citronella, which is a biotransformed terpene, I, I guess. Um, uh, but yeah, it's an interesting thing. And, and the fact that you've got, I mean, you already mentioned a couple of my favorite IPA brewers, you know, Matt and Vinny. And uh, whatever they're doing, I th- it's worth copying if they're doing it so well. And so if they're doing the, the I, I believe, um, uh, uh, Sapwood Cellars, that's where Scott Janish and Mike Tonsmeyer are brewing over in, in D.C. I believe they have a dual stage dry hopping thing that they do at separate temperatures specifically for, uh, for those reasons as well. Hmm. I like that uh, recipe, though, you have. It's good, good hop addition. Simcoe Centennial Amarillo. Classic, uh, huh? Yeah, it looks great. <laughs> I'm going to steal that. <laughs> you know, what's funny that there's a story behind that recipe. I got, I have a twin brother and uh, as terrifying as that sounds, we are far different. Um, but he, he got interested in brewing uh, about a decade ago. And so he, he lives out in New York and I flew out there and he bought all the stuff, uh, you know, to brew his own beer and really enjoyed it. And, and for, well, for a little while. And, uh, but, but every time he'd brew up a batch, he'd send me bottles of it. And he sent me, he, he made, he designed this whole recipe all by himself and so then I stole it and pretend to tell people it's mine. But but credit to Marco. To well, hey, man, you're, you're, you're your own like side by side experiment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is it weird when you kiss him? It's very weird. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Unless he has chapstick on. Oh, okay. <laughs> man, I don't know. I, I, I sort of, uh, you know, long for the days in home burning where we didn't know what terpenes were and citronella and and whatever the hell you said. You like rattle off a bunch of shit I've never heard. I'm like, I don't know. You've heard of it. Be quiet. You've heard that stuff. <laughs> Julie knows this. Wow. Jeez, you guys. Yes, and. You got to yes, and me, or I'm booting you. <laughs> no, I don't know. <laughs> so d- doing these things, does it change your um, home brewing at all? Or is it, because because a lot of what you're doing, I think, is more just information gathering. Um, how much of this do you actually take to heart and go, well, I, I'm going to do this now because of this experiment that I did? 
I, I have to imagine uh, both of you can relate with me on this one where, um, you know, you've, you've got, you've built up a name for yourself in, in the beer and brewing world. And so people oh, look to yeah. you as an authority. Yes. Yeah. Especially you, Jason. Thank you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> this is all I've ever wanted but, out of a show. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but you get questions all the time. Like what, how Black are you going to do this? What would you do? <laughs> Uh, and so that so that's probably one of the more common questions. And I and yeah. I the way I interpret it is that people want to hear me say I do the easiest thing possible every time. The reality is, I mean, of of the we've done we're coming up on four hundred and some odd experiments so far. And you know, if I changed every time a result came back, I wouldn't. I don't know if you'd be able to keep brewing. Um, I think more than anything. Well, what, one thing that that I, I like to point out is that when when we have a significant experiment. Uh, what we do is we collect data from the people who got the triangle test correct, and we ask them. Uh, they don't. We don't tell them what the the variable is or anything like that. But we have them compare just the two beers that are different, and then pick the one that they like the most. I hate the question. I'm not a big fan of of preference being this objective thing because it's not. But people wanted us to do that. Well, uh, like clockwork. Uh, every almost every significant experiment is cut right down the middle. You got half the people who like one of the beers half the people who like the other one and it doesn't matter what the variable is uh, i mean if you pooped in a batch i'm sure people would prefer the the clean one but beso- beyond that like most variables it's just, yeah maybe not you uh but, but mo- <laughs> most variables it, it it's hard to say that it produces a more desired outcome because what you desire is different than it's the same reason i'm not a big fan of hazy ipa and other people love it you know um so so with that I've, the things that have affected me the most, we started a series called Short and Shoddy, which is where I put a lot of the more wild stuff to the test. I'll, I'll mash for 25 minutes. I boil for 20 minutes. Mm-hmm. You know, that right there, you should have terrible conversion. You should have a sweet malty beer that, that has got DMS in it and uh, diacetyl and I'll ferment way too warm. And these beers, you know, 95% of the time come back completely fine and drinkable. Uh, some have even scored in the 40s in competition. I mean, you, you just don't expect it. But brewing is a rather forgiving thing. It's a rather forgiving operation. Yeah, I mean, it's sort of like being a beer judge in that in that regard because you can sit and you can judge a beer according to the style guidelines that maybe it doesn't meet the style, but it still tastes good. Sure, so sure. if you want to rebrew that beer, are you going to go for style or are you going to go for what tastes good? So yeah, that 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 question is sort of it's almost like a a data point that doesn't matter. Right. The preference thing, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's the that's my that's my big hang up with with competition and judging i'm a certified judge i i you know i get that world but if i the the, if i enter competition which i don't do anymore but if i do that it's not it's not to get objective valuable feedback on on who i am as a brewer you know it's what i read is oh these people who these two people who judged it seem to either like it or not like it i mean that that's the best you can do and yes we've got a standard there's guidelines that we judge by but i've judged with more than enough people to know that those guidelines are a little bit uh wishy-washy at times you know? oh for sure uh, every episode of dr homebrew we do it's <laughs> it's just like well this, this style got like brian and brian just go well i don't know i would i disagree with this in the style guidelines especially the 2015 that seems to have a lot of like <laughs> tension in the community because they've opened it up to a lot of different styles that are sort of big time it's just weird and 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 wonky but now, the, I would always, anytime I entered a competition, it would literally be just to try to win. I don't yeah, care right. what other people think about my beer because I know that it's not that great, but I don't want to sit in the, I still remember the first notes that I ever got back. It was like, don't add more of this grain. And the grain wasn't even in the fucking recipe. It was exactly. like black roasted <laughs> barley. And it's like, exactly. back off on the black roasted barley. And I'm like, okay, first of all, it's not in there. Second yeah. of all, you can go <laughs> pound that shit right up your urethra. Like, there's, what are you talking about? <laughs> Whoa. Yeah, I got real angry about it. Um, I'm sure, I mean, yeah. you, you've got to get it too, Sully, where somebody comes in and they got their nose in the air and they think they're an amazing beer evaluator and they call out, you know, diacetyl, D- <laughs> yeah, like exactly. JP's the exact perfect example. <laughs> Everything's wrong with every beer. That's right. The- you see that at the, the GABF as well. I mean, I don't know if I'm supposed to talk about this, but I mean, you know, you have like different, you know, it's a subjective environment. There's discussion that happens. I mean, you can have yeah. a pervasive judge that can kind of sway a table one direction or another. So you know, it's, you know, it may, it's not black and white. We're not like just measuring it with device and saying, this is the winner because it, you know, it's right. got these many points off this machine. So, yeah. 
And I feel like if it, with that perspective, it makes competing almost more fun because then it's there's an element of luck of the draw. There's an element of that, like, oh, you know, what judging pair am I going to get? You know, uh, and it doesn't have to be this this, uh, you know, the, the, the your score somehow reflects on you as a brewer overall it's it's that specific well, beer and whether JP. those judges like it affects you yeah man i get real heated about it yeah, i don't do it anymore yeah. yeah i don't do it shoving anymore. black malt in your urethra Jeez, man. <laughs> yeah golly it's, hard. it's really hard malt too it really <laughs> is yeah well you glue three of them in a line and you put that you know and then you try to stretch <laughs> oh you get your, anyway. you should try huskless wheat the uh, oh. midnight wheat Whoa. <laughs> man, i'm telling you that sounds good man let's uh let's do that i some flaked oats and wet them then do it it's much better <laughs> <There you go. laughs> Well, speaking of the pressure of that, your uh, your next most popular article was about fermentation under pressure, and I thought yeah. Sully was uh, <laughs> was uh, it was cool that you're going to be here for this, Sully, because uh, you know that's essentially the commercial beer world, I would imagine. Yeah. Or, I don't know, maybe uh, so. This is done by Greg. This is actually written by uh, someone other than Marshall, so you can sort of understand a little bit more. I don't know. I'm just, <laughs> now I'm just wow. Making, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now I'm just, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just bullshitting. I don't know. Uh, yeah. What was no, this? Greg's, a, Greg's a, one of the first guys who started contributing to Brewlosophy. He no longer does anymore, but he he did some really interesting work uh, back in the day. This is another really early what happened one, to April him? of 2015. What happened to him? He he, you know he uh, he had some medical too much issues. pressure. Yeah, oh, too sorry. much pressure. <laughs> sorry, that's bad. That's uh, he had good. some medical issues and ended up stopped brewing altogether. So okay. Oh damn. But he was curious. He was curious to find out about the impact that. Uh, uh, pressurized fermentation has on ale. Uh, that was his first test. I, I, I'm actually curious to hear you talk about this, Sully, because uh, he, he quoted a whole bunch of uh, commercial breweries here, Alpine, Bells, Stone Brewing, Ninkasi, Society, uh, Three Floyds, and The Alchemist all apparently brew um, under pressure or fermented. Well, I'm sorry, sorry to uh, disappoint you, but we do not do that. <laughs> And the, the, the so I don't either <laughs> on the homebrew level. Uh, my understanding, the idea is that if you do that, it's the excuse that you can use to get away with fermenting warmer uh, and with while, while suppressing ester uh, formation, right? Yes, that's the that's the big thing. So, um, well, we we wanted to put it to the test to the test on uh, the homebrew scale, and so. Uh, Greg brewed up a zombie dust clone. This is 2015, obviously. Um, <laughs> uh, and one of them he fermented under pressure. I think he kept it. Uh, he used a spunding valve to keep it between 5 and 6 PSI throughout fermentation while the other one was kept at atmospheric pressure, uh, so less than one bar. Um, and then kegged them up. Uh, they both finished at the same exact FG, one at 10, or both at 10, 12. And to my eyes, they looked identical to each other. Uh, I, th I, would, I would contend that Greg thought the same thing. Uh, he served these to, let's see here. How many people did he serve these to? 13 people overall. Again, this is an early one. We, we keep it to a minimum of 20 in non-COVID times these days. But he served it to 13 people. Eight would have had to get it right. Only six did. Uh, that is, again, that's you know just a, a hair over a third. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, the pressurized fermentation of an IPA, at the very least, didn't seem to have much of an impact. It's fascinating to me that this one is so popular. Uh, I didn't realize people were, were terribly concerned, at least homebrewers were terribly concerned about fermenting hoppy beers under pressure. Um, but, well, but, yeah. I mean, you know, again, I, I, everything I know goes back to more beer, but, you know, we had those pressurizable uh, conical fermenter lids. And uh, maybe that something has to do with with that because the uh, the ability to ferment under pressure wasn't even really around until relatively recently. So maybe it has yeah. something to do with that option. I do know Chris White at one point, I think it was on one of our shows, was saying uh, that if you do ferment under pressure, like a, like one or two psi, that is generally more beneficial for the yeast. Hmm. But I I might be getting that totally wrong. That antidote, you know, maybe just coalesced in my brain right now um but what I'm about sure hydrostatic else pressure i don't even know what that means i don't yeah, think that, that's <laughs> the weight of the mat you know the, oh, okay. the, the weight fluid. of the of the wort of the beer yeah 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 that's a good i mean you you can't really test that one too well on the homebrew scale we've done a we've done a comparison of uh fermentation vessels one that was more shallow and and wide had a larger diameter and one that was 
but even if that, I don't think it came back significant, but even if it did, I mean, um, that, that could be so many different things other than hydrostatic pressure. I think, mm. uh, the best area to do that would be in a, you know, on a commercial scale with actual, yeah. you know, measurable hydrostatic pressure differences. Yeah. Cause um, one thing Greg says in his article there was that, you know, most, you know, commercial home or most commercial brewers are fermenting under pressure, but it's that hydrostatic pressure. It sounds like, cause it's just the weight of the, of the liquid. Is, yeah. is compounding down below. So is that considered fermenting under pressure? No. Okay. I, I mean, I don't believe so. I, I think when people, when people use the term, you know, pressurized fermentation, they're talking about applying gas or capping uh, the tank so that there's a specific amount of gas in there, uh, again, to suppress ester, ester formation. Um, and I just don't, it's, I don't understand the science behind that concept at all. Uh, I don't understand why anybody on our scale, especially as a home brewer, would want to go through the, the trouble of doing it. <laughs> um, that being said, you mentioned uh, ge- the gear out there uh, that, that's available now so that you can ferment under pressure. I own, all, I own multiple uh, fermentation vessels that have the capacity to do that, but I don't use them for fermenting under pressure as much as I do pressurized transfers because of fear of cold side oxidation, um, stuff like that, you know, and, and, and to me, it, that makes it worth its weight in gold. I mean, I'm, I'm a big adherent these days uh, because of experimentation in the perils of cold side oxidation. So uh, but fermenting under pressure has never been anything that I've been terribly, you know, interested in doing myself. Yeah, it doesn't sound like uh, it's, it, it matters at all. Because also that's a lot of equipment. Well... <laughs> For most it's people, more, most home brewers, you know, for home brewers, yeah, it's a lot yeah, more equipment. Yeah, home brewers are, I mean, you know, it's all about the gear. I mean, this is like if you're a gearhead, this is awesome. Yeah, I agree. Uh, um, yeah, I, I'm not even a gearhead. I just like I like having the 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 gear that makes doing what it is I want to do easier. Uh, and right now, that means having a you know a ball or a a, a a disconnect on the fermentation vessel to connect gas to. Uh, and mm-hmm. some sort of a port uh, that you can get that gas out of without getting any contact, oxygen contact. And, um, you know, it, it, what's weird, and I, I, another thing I don't understand is I've, I've yet to really have issues with oxidation in beer. This has nothing to do with fermentation under pressure, but uh, in, in beers that are not highly hopped, the only beers where I've had a very noticeable uh, you know, impact from cold side oxygen exposure have been hoppy beers. Uh, yep. And that, and that, that spans style of hoppy beer too. I mean, I've made pale ales that start to per- turn that grayish purple color. If I don't package them correctly, I've made new England IPAs that do the same thing. Um, and I, that is to me, uh, there aren't very many things in beer, you know, outside of a contamination that taste worse than, <laughs> uh, than that oxidized uh, hoppy beer. Ugh. Yeah, oxidation is awful. Uh, awful. Luckily, my well, actually, not unluckily, uh, my business partner Nico cannot detect oxidation. So <laughs> we'll like be drink, we'll be tasting beers on a panel. He's like, "This one's fine." He's like, "Are you kidding? Are you getting oh, the man. cardboard? Do you, are you chewing paper right now? What's going on?" <laughs> I love everything I, we do. <laughs> love this. That's, that's most it. home brewers. Yeah, <laughs> no, it's perfect, man. You gotta t- taste this. You are it's brewing good. some amazing <laughs> shit, brother. <laughs> it's like, to me, the, the, the cold side beer. oxidation thing in, in hoppy beers, I get as a the way I describe it to people is if you take a uh, if you take a lemon head candy drop and you strip it of the lemon flavor, mm-hmm. that weird <laughs> sickly sweet kind of grandma's coffee or or candy dish thing. Ugh, that's I just oxidation can't it. to you. That's absolutely. Huh. We've intentionally oxidized beer to see what we can get out of it, and every single time with a hoppy beer. And I think what it is, is a lot of those uh, hop characteristics are sticking around. So it's reminiscent of that, that sweetness and that fruity thing that you get from those candies. But then it, that oxidation uh, creates when oxygen interacts with certain compounds in fermented beer, uh, it produces aldehydes that are definitely sweet, perceptibly sweet, right? So you can get an almond like characteristic from them well almond is associated associated with candy flavors at times you can get lemony and limey things and it's but it's not in a good way it's not like the fresh lemon and lime <laughs> that you get from hops it is the it, it really is the most awful uh uh beer flavor that i can that i can think <laughs> of outside of a contamination i really don't like it yeah 
Sorry, I'm just uh, sitting here uh, reporting all the ads as spam on your website. I hope you don't mind. <laughs> just, all you do is get an ad blocker, man. <laughs> hey, thanks for supporting us, by the way. <laughs> clicking on them and reporting them. That's all constantly. That's all I'm doing. Do you so in the chat? There's there's some lively conversation in the the Facebook chat, which someone was like, "Oh, so this is where the uh, show chat is nowadays, huh?" Yeah, that's, <laughs> it's where we are. I don't know. Um, you your experiments and 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 your show. Well, I don't know about your show because I don't listen, but uh, your experiments in general, especially what online. He's saying is he loves it. He's listening to it. <laughs> get, yeah, yeah. Get, no, I see. I, I, I watch him on Facebook. <laughs> listen to it every week. Yeah. Um, it, it it definitely gets some uh, some polarizing feedback. There are people who uh, who uh, hate what you're doing. Yeah, uh, and yep. there are people hate? who love it. Yeah, really? well, not not hate, What's but going on? but I I think you definitely get some pushback, and especially with topics like this that are you know I guess hard to pin down without doing multiple multiple tests in different ways or whatever. You're just you're, you're sort of uh, experimenting a little bit, uh, which is a good name for any sort of series that you're going to be doing. Um, but yeah, people uh, push back on it. How do you handle that? How do you not just stop? He's a therapist. I mean, he's a <laughs> PhD in psychology. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I've I, I don't think you you make it this far in a in a public, um, uh, you know, when your face is not, w- without being able to deal with it. I mean, I, I just don't care. I mean, I, I don't know how else to put it. it. Makes me sound arrogant, maybe, but it's beer first off secondly if you're so emotionally tied to an approach that you're going to you're going to get all up in arms and 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 make a scene on social media that says more about your own insecurities than it does about what we're doing <laughs> for fun so fuck off i, I yeah. don't care yeah. uh, there's this is this i could go down so many holes on this cuz you're right I mean, we get a lot of pushback but there's a yeah. specific approach to brewing out there these days that I've never done, so I can't speak to. I've never spoken to it. I've never said anything negative about it. But the perception that that brewlosophy is glean has developed of this specific approach to brewing, particularly lager styles, uh, is that we question it. Now, I have asked, "Hey, why don't you send me some of these beers? I'd love to taste it." Uh, when I've asked for help coming up with a way for myself to brew uh, this way, I've been told I don't have the proper gear. Well, I'm not. I like the lager beers that I make, so I'm not going to go buy all this special gear, which isn't cheap, you know. Um, and so th- we've we developed this, you know, perspective from this small subsect of brewers out there that that listen and say, well, these guys don't know what the hell they're talking about. Obviously, if they read these books that are only come in German, they would know way more. Um, <laughs> that's totally fine wow. with me. I, I, I yeah, I don't. The the the, the fact of the matter is this. If you do it and you love it, more power to you. Now, when you try to sell that as you know, like gospel, like that is the only way to do it. Well, okay, then you're opening yourself up to a little bit of critique. Mm-hmm. But but if but if you're cool with everyone else doing what they're doing, and you're not going to go home and get butt hurt and cry on your you know dog's lap yeah. uh, because somebody does something different than you, fucking grow up. I mean, I don't know what else to tell you. <laughs> you know. We're just doing this for fun. It's beer, man. You know, that's right. I mean, it, yeah, I we might learn agree. something from it. I but. completely agree. I mean, what is the point? You're on this planet for a half a second. You're exactly. putting some information. You've done an experiment. You're putting it out there. You're, sh- you're, you're showing the results. You're showing your process. And, you know, I, I think it's awesome you're doing that. I mean, I don't. I appreciate that. It's a little silly. Sully. Uh, I hate it. No, I mean, <laughs> I mean I've, I've made comments too, and it, it is sort of, you know. Uh, you hate not, what? No, I'm just kidding. Um, any sort of like, it's not like any, you know, malicious or, or anything, but it is sort of fun to sort of poke back. Um, mm-hmm. But also, one thing I, I personally need to, 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 to remember, but everybody needs to remember, is that you're not saying this is now how you do the thing. Right. Everybody must do this. Right. It's not, you're not saying that, that we have figured Mr. out. Oracle on the hill. Yeah. You're not, <laughs> the, this exactly is not right. the right way oh, to do it. Now. This is just what we learned in one moment in time doing it this particular way that this yeah. thing that you like to do literally matters not. If I it. had a, if I had a nickel for every time I've felt compelled to remind our listeners and our readers that we are not prescribing anything. This is just information, but you know, it, it's funny. I, I often say we're not trying to cure cancer here. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's one of the reasons I justify <laughs> using the P value. Okay, it's, it works for us. If you want to change it, if you want to, you can choose to believe what you want. Look at the world we live in. Holy shit. I mean, people are doing that already. This is just beer, you right. know? Um, 
I just, I, it, it's just interesting to me that, that people so badly feel the need to have others agree with them and to be on their side that they're willing to go to such lengths to separate themselves from other people, you know, to put yeah. this distance between them. I just think it's really interesting. Um, that's the psychologist in me talking as well. I'm sure the philosopher in me, but it wouldn't be philosophy. It wasn't for a little bit of philosophy, I suppose. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, well, it's you're participating it's, in the scientific yeah. method. And actually, because of that, you're actually allowing crit criticism, but the criticism has to be based on a scientific method as well. And you have to challenge it. Way, well, I found something different here. So, yeah, yeah you know, come to the exactly. Lyceum and fucking tell me to my face in my robe. <laughs> fucking let's go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're, well, and that you're the QAnon of the brewing world. Oh, you're, come you're making, on. Yes. I swear to God. You're you're making, you know who people, the QAnon is? It's the other people I'm talking about. You're Trust me. You're making people <laughs> question reality. Think, I read this stuff. I think I'm mirror. I'm familiar yeah. with this. is awesome. I mean, you Dude, know what I'm I mean? I'm telling you, Loggergate is happening. Yeah. Uh, there is an underground layer <laughs> where all we do is ferment lagers warm. And um, Think logic. Oh, so you have a commercial brewery? That's cool. <laughs> no, I don't. Mm. I am excited to announce, though, we've got a local brewery opening up here that we're going to be doing a lot of. Uh, uh, we're going to move our experimentation into the commercial realm here, uh, coming coming real soon. Oh. So that's that's an exciting development. In nice. The world of what's yeah. uh, what's the what's it called? The brewery is called Crow and Wolf. Uh, it's got it's made up of uh, people from other breweries around the Central Valley area and uh, some of the some of the bigger name uh, breweries around here as well. So. Uh, they're they're hitting it big. They're starting off with a, a huge, uh, huge space. Uh, really nice, uh, big uh, brewing system. They've got uh, a setup that's kind of set aside for brewlosophy stuff as well. It's it's pretty nuts. It's gonna be cool. <laughs> they have a big brewing system and they're just doing really good stuff crow well, and wolf. I, I, i'll qualify that how many how many professional brewers do you know who start off on a one barrel you, a rig that's it's mm. i'm just saying it's not yeah. that we'll put it that way yeah crow and wolf crow and wolf that's crow right okay and where is that that'll be in clovis california clovis so, california uh, all right well that's cool yeah. man. So next time you're next time we're having a sleepover jason you can uh we'll bounce over there yeah, yeah. please do that'd be great um uh, what was I going to say? You just distracted me, got me horny for a second. Now I can't think of what I was I was talking a wholesome sleepover, like where we, oh, where we watch Rad, at, uh, you know, and yeah. then <laughs> me too. Cheese puff. I, I like that shit. I don't know. Um, so they have a section for your for your setup. Mm. Not for my setup. They've got you said uh, a brulosity they, thing. Yeah, for for doing brulosity stuff, um, they're really interested in the in the mm. sciencey side of it as well. Um, the head brewer is a real good friend of mine, has been for a while. He's brewed at House of Pendragon here. He's brewed at, uh, uh, he brewed at Full Circle Brewing. Mm -hmm. I believe oh. both have been on the session in the past, in fact. Yeah. Um, so, so, yeah, he's, he's the head brewer over there now with, with Spencer Andrews. That's, that's Brad Gaines and Spencer Andrews who, who are going to be heading up the brewing stuff over there. And, uh, yeah, they've got multiple different things going on. Um, but, but, yeah, part of what we're going to be doing is, kind of bringing the homebrew experimentation that we've been focusing on for the last almost seven years now into the commercial brewing world. Because why not? I mean, it, people, there are commercial brewers we know who listen to the show and who read the stuff that we put out, but wonder, uh, you know, how, how does this apply on a, on a larger scale? And so that's yeah. kind of what we're aiming to tackle. You just email them back, say, find out for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> put peanut butter in it. Yeah, I don't fucking, I don't Again. care. Yeah. Uh, okay. let, let's take a quick break and we're going to come back. We're going to talk about your last most popular article and uh, close out the show talking a little more about homebrew. Hang on, everybody. It's the session. We'll be right back. Tuned into the session because life's too short to listen to crappy radio. Hey, thanks for sticking around, everybody. We're winding things up here, or winding things down, I guess, with Marshall from Brewlosophy.com and, of course, Sean O'Sullivan from a brewery somewhere. What's the name <laughs> of your brewery right. again? It's just called the brewery. Actually, I, that's already a name. I can't take <laughs> that, so I'll just call it the 21st <laughs> Amendment. Yeah. Well, but is it the brewery like spelled right or is it the brewery like <laughs> brewlosophy is the brewery? <laughs> yeah. Is there an umlaut in it? That's the question. <laughs> All right. That brings even... the metal to the, to yeah. the game. Look at Marshall, by the way, stealing brewlosophy from the brewery. Oh, wow. yeah. That's right. That's right. Wow. Yeah. Tom Arthur's real. Cease uh, and desist yeah. ale <laughs> <laughs> under pressure. <laughs> oh. 
I don't know, man. Uh, grain comparisons. This one I found interesting, too, because uh, I'm excited know, about this. Everyone talks about, uh, you know, throw in a little bit of this, or a little bit of that different sort of base malt um, to, to, to goose a little bit of flavor or, or do whatever. I don't know, maybe to, set, to, to seem more continental. But uh, you did one uh, pale malt versus Pilsner malt. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this one was brewed by our contributor, Jake Houlihan, who still does quite a bit of brewing for Brewlosophy and uh, co-hosts the show uh, every once in a while. Um, yeah, he was interested in, in comparing pale malt to Pilsner malt. I, I want to hear what you guys think about the differences in that. Cause I, I remember for me, uh, what, you know, when I was growing up and brewing, it mm. was pale malt contributed more of a rich malt character, maybe a little bit more biscuity, uh, not, not overwhelmingly biscuity, but kind of a toastier biscuity thing. Whereas Pilsner malt was more like white bread, uh, maybe a little bit of crust, um, but that, that one was obviously more appropriate for certain styles and the other was more appropriate for other styles. Uh, so what, yeah, what, I mean, how have you, are you, you're, I'm imagine you're still using them, uh, for specific reasons in your brewery. Yeah, we use it. Uh, we use Pilsner malt. Actually, we switched from, uh, uh, to a domestic Pilsner malt in El Sully, as a matter of fact, it didn't detect a, a, a change at all. I could but tell. I mean, like the common thinking is like, like you said, I mean, the color's a little bit lighter, uh, the flavors are a little bit cleaner. It's probably not as robust, you know, yeah. as pale malt. So, you know, I've, I've, you know, drank the Kool-Aid on that. <laughs> well, maybe there's a reason for that though. Yeah. Uh, I mean, so what Jake, that, that was exactly what I, that, that was, those are my impressions as well. I don't care what Jason thinks, but uh, <laughs> fuck that guy, that Jason uh, guy. So, so Jake, uh, brewed up a, a, it looks like he was doing a anchor, uh, anchor lager. Uh, type of clone kind of that he made up himself or something inspired by that. Um, and so he did either about 96% pale malt or 96% Pilsner malt. Uh, I believe the pale malt, yeah, came from RAR. It was RAR two row and the Pilsner was classic, you know, Vireman malt. Uh, he also added eight ounces or, or about 4% of acidulated malt and then 0.4% uh, black prince. I'm sorry, it's 4% acid malt. Black prince just for color. Um, he, he admitted that. It was hopped with just Comet throughout uh, the boil. Uh, let's see. So, so some of the more interesting findings here, he took some uh, mash pH measurements, with I, which I thought was kind of interesting. They actually ended up being relatively similar. Uh, the pale malt was 5.27, and the uh, Pilsner malt was 5.3, which you would expect given the fact that the pale malt is slightly darker. We know that there's a, you know, the darker uh, roasted a, a grain gets, the more acidic it gets. Uh, but still, you know, that that's close enough to say they're about the same, in my opinion. Um, it, in the end, the worts were uh, exactly the same OG. I didn't expect that. In my experience, prior to this experiment, in my experience, the uh, Pilsner malt uh, was always more efficient for me uh, out of the mash. I would constantly get higher OG and to the point that in my uh, my brewing calculator, I use Beersmith, that it... Um, I have a I have a different profile set up when I'm using primarily Pilsner malt versus pale malt uh, because I get I get higher OG when typically when I'm using Pilsner malt over over pale malt. Hmm. I don't remember ever noticing a big difference in that, but maybe because my OG or my final gravities or my starting gravities or whatever I'm see I'm getting back into it uh, <laughs> just varied anyways because you know that's just the nature of home brewing in general for me anyway is that shit just goes weird sometimes I can't really hit this consistently um, but you know then again I'm also so, changing my grain all the time so uh, what do I yeah it shit's weird all the time yeah I mean, yeah I basically yeah, yeah for sure <laughs> yeah well, uh, Jake got both at 1052. So that, that goes to show that shit goes weird for me too. Cause I don't know where I got my, my assumption from that Pilsner malt was more, uh, converted better for me, but, uh, both of the beers were fermented out, uh, at 58 degrees Fahrenheit. Again, these were, these were kind of a uh, hybrid lagers that he was making. Um, the pale malt and the, uh, and the Pilsner malt beers, both, both finished around the same 1013 OG. That was another thing that I was hmm. I, I I thought was kind of interesting, but again, not terribly surprising based on uh, you don't hear talk about you know uh, attenuation and stuff when it comes to certain base malts. Usually, it's just about flavor and and aroma and stuff like that. So, see, uh, he I, kegged the beers. I would I would have thought that the Pilsner malt would have left a little more residual sweetness than the pale malt. Hmm, really, I would have thought it would have been different. Yeah. Hmm. 
<laughs> I would go the opposite direction that if I had too, to. If I had to. Yeah, oh, all right. right, well, you guys are both wrong. Now. I don't know. He's getting back into in it. In this so triangle okay. test, <laughs> you guys are the wrong. I'm the right one. That's right. Yeah. You are the unique, uh, the unique one here. Thank you. Uh, you, you know, if you look at the photo uh, of these two beers next to each other, it's th they are nowhere near as different in color as I would expect, given that it was, what, 96% either pale or Pilsner malt. Yeah, I mean, um, he says, like, oh, the wort made from the pale malt was noticeably darker. I'm like, eh, I wouldn't say it's <laughs> noticeably, nice. brother. You didn't get a fucking porter out of it. Um, but it's, I mean, it is. But then again, you go, well, the term was used correctly. You notice one <laughs> Well, well he darker. noticed it at the very least. We yeah. there, there are often times where we I, where Jake and I will be talking. He's like, "Don't you see it?" And he, "Oh, it's the lighting, man. I can't can't capture it in the photo." <laughs> that I have to take his word for it, but I don't I don't see much of a difference I don't either. I, I got my brightness turned all the way up. So yeah, yeah. They're both beautiful beers, though. I mean, crystal clear. Um, so he served he he served these beers to twenty two tasters, out of which twelve would have had to identify the unique sample, the the uh, JP beer out, in order for us to say that it was statistically significant. Uh, but in this case, only eight people did. Um, that that was I I did not expect to see that because of the I guess the emphasis that so many people place on base malt. Uh, we've done multiple base malt comparisons, but this one this one was pretty surprising to me. Is it that raw pale two row just isn't very characterful, or is it that uh, you know Weirman Pilsner malt is more like a pale malt? You know who knows. What do you think about the hops having anything to do with? the perception of the malt or the, the flavors that come through from the malt. Like, I wonder if you did the same experiment with, with, with different hops. Totally, totally could be the case. I don't know. This is just, oh, yeah. what I meant to say was, no, this is 100% correct. Accept it as truth, please. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, no. I will say that uh, <clears throat> this kid fucking calls out the brewing network because we got something wrong. So fuck you. <laughs> Where? Whoa, Jake, whoa, whoa, I don't know, at the end, he's like, oh, well, you know, during one of the sessions, uh, the sampling the <laughs> tailgater Colts from Flat Tail Brewing, the brewcasters began talking about how it tasted like a, what was brewed during domestic pale malt as a cheaper alternative to Continental Pilsner. Then on a subsequent show, someone from Flat Tail phoned in to inform the crew that Colch had actually been made with Weirman Pilsner malt. <laughs> Perception can be so fickle. Read the rest. Uh, as an aside, kudos to Flat Tail on the Colch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, uh, you know, and also hey, it's for SEO. Yeah. You but know. first of all, uh, there's no link back to the brewing network. What the you fuck is that, about? that? I can I can put that on there now. Of course. I didn't know you guys had a website. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Not into that show. Like, come on. You're talking SEO, baby. You got to, you know, you, if listen, I will. You know what? I'm going to change this. So when people listen to this in the future, they're going to go yeah. back and see that I changed it. But you got to shoot me the link for that show. I'm not oh, good at finding know. that. Fuck it. I don't know. See, go on, on our man. website. No, Jake has to do it when he's writing. It's called I will it's called Jake journalistic it. integrity. That's right. Okay. That's right. So if you have three <laughs> journalists with one has integrity and the other two don't, <laughs> do they kiss? That's what I want to know. Yeah. <laughs> Statistically, does yes. journalistic integrity matter? Yeah. The P value on that. It's capital P. Mm, that and, is definitely yeah. for yeah, That's funny that you read through that whole thing. I didn't even know he did, did that. Yeah. It's probably why this one's so popular. People Google the Brewing Network and we come up first. <laughs> That's right. I would love that, to be honest with you. <laughs> By the way, speaking of that, our Twitter account goes hacked. What? No what? shit. I think it's still hacked right <laughs> now. Yeah. It's, uh, someone just it. took it over and then uh, was like tweeting. I don't even know what the fuck they were doing. Like, someone told me about it because I don't follow the Brewing Network anywhere. And, um, <laughs> and then I guess enough people reported it as being hacked that it was shut down. And I thought it was deleted. I'm like, that's actually really funny. <laughs> um, and then it came back up hacked. again. Yeah, I know, me too. Um, I don't really. Uh, and then it came back up again. And then I started tweeting him. I was like trying to challenge him to like, uh, you know, drop some bars and let's do a battle <laughs> rap. And uh, then it, it got shut down again. So I don't know where we're at right now. I know Justin's working on it right now with uh, Twitter support. But uh, mm. yeah, our Twitter is, uh, is not ours right now. Which for some that we've got is we had a uh, we've had multiple I think they call them DDoS attacks on the oh, website. Yeah. Oh boy, those are fun to deal with. Well, Yikes. that's probably just someone on that? your like doing your server and not necessarily you specifically, or is it just you? The so I thought it was the same thing. Like oh, the server that we you know our yeah. host whatever is being attacked, and so I'll go to them and they're like, no, 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 you've got 
basically what it is is the, these compute. This is the way it was explained to me. I'm a dummy when it comes to this. Is that you've got these computers that set up like like laser beams to your specific website, and they hit it so many times that it uses up all your resources. Yeah. Um, and this has happened probably I don't know eight or nine times in the last five or six years. It's, it's wild. And it takes, we're talking like three or four weeks of the site constantly going down and then me getting emails from people saying it won't go up. And yeah, it's, it sucks, man. See, and you can't pay enough in security to, keep, to stop it from happening. You pay for the security to fix it when it happens is, is the way it works. So. Yeah. yeah. Jesus. It's a pain in the ass. Yeah. I wish it was like some rival, you know, got, rival home brewer out there who thinks you guys are so full of shit. He wants to DDoS your... Your website. I wish that was the case, but it's probably someone from the Ukraine just having nothing better to do. That is my guess. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's my guess as well. I can't imagine pressure haters. Yeah, I can't, right. I can't. I can't imagine there are brewers out there with enough animosity towards us to uh, invest the energy in doing such a thing. But. Yeah, for sure. Also, I don't know how to do it. Yeah, me either. Yeah. So you're saying uh, use you can use two row malt for your pilsners? That's what I'm getting out of this whole thing. We'll bring it right <laughs> no, back. No, no, we're around. saying you have to now. That yeah. it's. Because we proved yes, it. No. Exactly. Wireman stocks are tanking right now. <laughs> hey, Ben, uh, cancel the contracts. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, just get the cheapest Great Western you can find. The, you know, the reality is that, that e- this is the perfect example of uh, I still keep Pilsner malt on hand. I've got Saxe Pilsner malt, Saxe Pale malt, Saxe Maris Otter. You know Vienna Munich. I do all of that. We did we did a Munich and a Vienna comparison. Way to brag. Uh, that that came back that people. I think it was barely significant, which is not scientific way of putting that. But surprisingly, it was way more similar than you'd think, despite the colors being vastly different. You know, you're still going to use those malts. Uh, mm-hmm. that, we're brewers. That's what we do. So overcomplicate exactly. things. Yeah, we overcomplicate yeah. things. Well, I mean, there and is think a, that we're better than we are. That's well, that is true. Thing. I mean, there is a romance to 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 brewing, you know, especially on the homebrew side. And uh, maybe I don't know. I don't think you lose that. At least Sully, I don't think you've lost the the romance and the allure of of homebrewing because you still homebrew. But even on a commercial, no, scale, I love like, it. I mean, I do it on a little bigger scale right now at the yeah. pub. But you know, which is I think is a lot like homebrewing. I mean, it's I have sort of the similar equipment that people do at home, just maybe pumps and probably homebrewers have pumps and the ability to control yeah. fermentation temperatures. So yeah, I think it's a lot like home brewing. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't get to brew nearly as much as I used to in the beginning of this. Cause I'm managing all of the other stuff going on, but I still, I still get out to my garage a couple times a month and, and throw a batch together. And every single time this sounds a bit sentimental, uh, but every single time, as soon as I mash in and those smells start coming off oh, yeah. the mash tun and the, you make that first hop addition <laughs> and you crack open that, that yeast pouch Every time it just takes me back to the beginning and why I do all this. And it, that again, it sounds kind of cheesy, but it's true. And it, it's what keeps me brewing. And it's what I love so much about. I mean, there's really not much <laughs> keeping me doing this other than my love of the brewing and, and the brewing industry and, you know, the folks that I get to meet and, but, but making beer, it's just a lot of fun, you know? Yeah. You, uh, your next experiment should be on uh, if you have to clean corny kegs before you use them. Oh, my God. Do you really have to do that? Because uh, that's what really kills me from homebrewing and, you know, no cap. Like, it's, I, I hate cleaning kegs. I hate the kegs. I fucking hate them. I don't like them. I hate Why is it so it? hard? I don't, it's not hard? hard. I just don't like doing it. I'm, okay. I'm, I'm with you, dude. It, it, so it, do it, one Cleaning on kegs Jake. is my least favorite thing. It's the, my least favorite thing yeah. in all of the brewing process. I'd rather clean up a million brew days than clean a single keg. Um, it, it's not that hard, but I hate doing it. It's as actually well. my so favorite good. thing, guys. So <laughs> I'm one out of three. Well, you are the one out of three. Statistically, yeah. I lose. Well, hey, man, if you need that, some extra cash on the side, I got 20 uh, kegs to sell you. I'll be right there. <laughs> Well, Marshall, uh, look, man, thanks for, for helping us talk a little bit about home brewing on the Brewing Network. On the session it's my pleasure. Here, man. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Yeah. Um, one, one little, uh, we've got some new things coming up soon. In fact, uh, just what you got? This, this week, what was that? What do you, I said, what do you got? I interrupted what you to you tell got? you what you got. So yeah, go ahead. <laughs> we, uh, we got the Brewlosophy podcast in, in addition to Brewlosophy.com. Uh, but we just announced, or we're we're just announcing on this show as it happens. Uh, we we just released this week the introduction episode to a new podcast that we're starting called the Brew Lab, where uh, contributor Cade Job goes into the lab uh, with uh, actual brewing scientists to talk about more objective 
uh, scientific research that they've performed. I think it's going to be really neat. Uh, Cade's in, currently at Oregon State University in their brewing program doing the post-baccalaureate stuff. And uh, first episode's going to drop in the next four to six weeks, but you can go subscribe now. And uh, again, I think it's going to be cool. Our first guest is going to be Dr. Tom Shellhammer, who hasn't heard of him. Uh, just an excellent uh, resource. And I, and again, it's going to be focused a bit more on the objective side of brewing science as opposed to our... So it's going to be called The Brew Lab, but that's B-R, you guessed it, umlaut U. Uh, <laughs> it, it should be searchable in most places. We're still waiting on approval from Google, uh, but Spotify, while, Apple Podcasts, yeah. uh, Stitcher, it's all there now. So it uh, should, be, should be a lot of fun. So Nice. Well, that sounds cool, man. I'm 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 happy. It's it's good to see you guys growing. I feel a lot like a like a parent, like a grandparent, just I patting know. you guys. Growing like more it. gray hair too. Oh God, my God! Last time I was on the show. Tell me about it. <sighs> Tell me about it. At least I got hair, right? That's yeah. true. That's, uh, yeah, <laughs> that's it, bud. Yeah. All right. It's I'm there. subscribing. Yeah. And everybody else should too. Yeah, I appreciate that. It, it's it, again. This one, you're not going to have to hear my stupid voice. Any longer. Oh, this really? one, this All one right, is, I'm not subscribing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is K Job. Again, he's a student at Oregon State, and he's going to be doing, he's already got, you know, 15 people lined up to, uh, and they're going to focus specifically on research papers. I, it's going to just tickle that nerd in all of us, I think. So mm. excellent. Yeah. Cool. Well, that sounds great, man. Awesome. Um, all right. Well, we're gonna we're gonna get out of here. Sully, thanks a lot, man, for the uh, for rounding up 2000 for, uh, 2020 with me, <laughs> for me, to me. <laughs> What's going on? Are you okay? Me. Are you having a stroke? Uh, I might be. I don't know. No, I'm just thinking too far ahead in what I'm trying to say. That's all. Okay. You know, real professional podcaster shit. <laughs> we love you. You're doing fine. <laughs> Thanks, man. Uh, thank you, everybody, for listening to the show. Thank you, everybody, for listening to The Brewing Network, which is the premier home brewing podcast. Everybody knows that. Every yeah, other right. home brewing podcast are, uh, are, are not as good. And I want you to know all that right now. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, yeah, thanks to Marshall and the entire Brewlosophy crew. I appreciate it very much. Um, I don't know, man. 2020 has is, uh, is been great, and I hope that 2021 continues. Um, I hope everyone gets the vaccine, and we can all uh, we can all go to Homebrew Con or some shit, man. I don't know. I want to do something. Gather and kiss. That's all we got. That should you know what? we should do a, a beer festival and have it called Gather and Kiss. <laughs> and um, I don't know. All right. Well, thanks a lot, everybody. We'll work on it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I appreciate it. Happy New Year, and uh, we'll see you later. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. JP's an asshole. Justin's on my sky and when